Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bill, I work for Molly Aftermarket down in Farmington Hills, Michigan. 47 years ago, I graduated from college and went to work teaching agriculture. And uh, I was always handy, and my dad was a tool and die maker, so my side of the business and teaching agriculture was the shop stuff. So I taught engine rebuilding and tractor overhaul and small engine repair and stuff like that. And then after 10 years of that, I went to work for Dana. And Dana had a machine shop training center and they said, we need an instructor. So they hired me to be the instructor. That was 1981. So I've been there and matter of fact, that shop ran until 9-11. Uh, and then by then business had gotten kind of tough and people weren't interested in learning the engine rebuilding business. So uh, we shut that center down and I went to work for a company called Clevite that Dana had bought. And then you know the rest of the story. I was one of the lucky guys. I retired from Dana at midnight and 12.01 a.m. went to work for Molly. Anyhow, I'm here to talk about rings today. Let's get with it. Uh, most engines out here, matter of fact, everything you drove to work today, assuming it has a piston engine in it, diesel or gas makes no difference. It's what we call a three ring piston. It's got three piston rings on each piston. We got a top ring. And naturally, that's the one up at the top of the piston. That's how it gets its name. And we got a second ring, and we got an oil ring. So the top ring and the second ring and the oil ring keep the combustion gases in the cylinder where they make power. And they try to keep most of the oil down in the crankcase where it lubricates all the parts. And it's that simple, except they have to do that millions of times. What's the top ring's job in an engine? It's to keep the compression gas up in the cylinder. We don't want compression gas leaking by the ring because if it does, we don't make as much power. The gas needs to stay up there in that cylinder so it can push the piston down and generate power. So the top ring is, really this graph isn't quite accurate. That top ring should be literally solid blue all the way across. Its job is to control compression. Now the second ring, we've called that a compression ring for years. And some of our customers are still confused about its job. But the second ring, that graph isn't very accurate either. It should be mostly yellow. Because the second ring's job is mostly to control the oil, scrape it back off the cylinder wall down into the crankcase, and don't let it get up into the combustion chamber where it's going to burn. If it gets in the combustion chamber and burns, we have a couple problems nowadays. One is smoke, and the other is fouled catalytic converters and emission issues with our customers that we sell the rings to on the OE side. So we don't want oil getting up into that cylinder. We want to keep it down in the, in the crankcase. And then the oil ring graph, it probably should be all yellow, no blue whatsoever. That oil ring, its job is to scrape oil back into the cylinder. Matter of fact, if you talk to some of the ring engineers, they'll talk about the oil ring is gross oil control. Gross meaning it just gets most of the oil, takes care of most of it. The second ring is what we call fine oil control. It scrapes all the oil off, but just enough to lubricate the rings, enough that they don't seize into the cylinder as they slide up and down. So oil ring, three piece, gross oil control, Oil ring, second ring, fine oil control. Matter of fact, this is an interesting little point. We're doing so good on this PVD steel ring that we're selling these uh, drag racing teams that we've talked about, we haven't done it, but we talked about eliminating the second ring. That ring does such a good job, uh, and the oil ring does such a good job, we think we could probably eliminate the second ring, and the thing would run pretty good. That's amazing. Those engines, by the way, they're not real big. They're 490 cubic inches, which is like a big, big size truck engine. But they make right now between 11 and 12,000 horsepower. So the uh, rings see a lot of abuse. 10,000 pounds per square inch of pressure on the ring, a lot of heat, and I uh, see a lot of abuse. But they're really, the rings that you're making here work so well that we think we could probably do that. We've probably in another year or two, somebody will get brave enough to try it and uh, then everybody will follow along. <laughs> we'll go that route. So anyhow, 
This is the purpose of rings. It makes no difference, frankly, either whether it's that 11,000 horsepower race car or your car you drove to work. The same function is always the case. And if you got a diesel, anyone drive a diesel to work? Nope. If you have one, same function. Different fuel, but the rings provide the same function. A big semi trucks that come in here, same thing. They got an engine with a three ring piston in it and their job of those rings is no different than the job of the rings in your car or in Coletta's race car. Keep the compression up here, keep the oil down here, enough to lubricate the pack and we're good to go. In the olden days when you were making what we call the pressure back ring here, PB ring, and it was ductile cast iron, they changed them every pass, every thousand feet they took those rings out and threw them away. The steel PVD ring is so good now that I got teams that are running it four times. So that's four, almost a mile before they get rid of it. Top ring designs. In the olden days when I started, we, we had what we called it, and I have pictures of these coming up. We had a taper faced ring, what we called a positive twist at perfect circle. Nowadays, top ring designs are almost all radius or barrel faced. You lap them up and down here at the plant to get that radius on them for us, but they're all barrel faced. They may or may not be non-directional. All those taper face rings were directional. They had a little dot on the top, and if you got them in upside down, they didn't work too good. But as we've gotten into smaller and smaller rings, we've gotten away in many cases from a directional ring into a non-directional ring. And it's been an advantage. The barrel faced, uh, radius face rings break in faster. They have constant contact with the cylinder wall, even at top dead center when the piston rocks slightly from one side to the other. Taper face ring would lose contact for an instant. But a barrel face ring, it just changes the position of the contact, doesn't lose it. So at the critical spot where an engine needs to make power, a uh, barrel face ring does a better job of maintaining that contact with the cylinder. So numerous advantages. And as I said, I have some pictures here. These are non-twisted top compression rings. And you can see now how we get the name barrel for the face. As you can see in the drawing, see how the face is bowed out like a barrel? Well, that's where it came up with the barrel face name. And these pictures here, one, the top one's a Molly one. And you do a lot of those still here at this plant. And as many of you know, uh, to do the molly coating on the ring, you actually have to cut a groove into the face of the ring, a channel to spray that molly into. And you can actually see the little artist rendition there. On either side of the molly is ring material protecting that molly. So by laying it in there with protective edges of ring material, parent material, we protect that molly and keep it from fracturing and breaking out. The reason we use molybdenum at all is it's an elemental metal, at least before we add things like ceramic and other materials to it. And it's got about 4,200 degrees of capability of handling heat before it melts. Now steel, you know, will melt about, what, 2,000 degrees, 1,800 degrees. So by putting molybdenum on the face of a ring, you make a ring that is much more resistant to heat. Well, what do you have in engines today? Lots of heat. And so molly has been a very, very popular material for engines for years because of the heat resistance. Now to contrast that to the chrome, which you're still using today, chrome will handle about 3,200 degrees. So the molly will handle another 1,000 degrees of heat over the chrome. Now another plus thing about the molly is if you were to look at the molly face coating under a microscope, it would look like you were looking at someone's picture of the surface of the moon. You ever seen a picture of the moon surface? All the craters? Well, Molly's full of these little craters. It's a very porous material. Now, what that does for us is it allows the little bit of oil that's up there to have something to cling to and get into and hang on to. So a Molly ring tends to be a well lubricated ring which again, if we keep the ring lubricated, we don't build the heat. So a lot of heat resistance to start with, and then the porous surface allows us to maintain a good oil film. So it's been an excellent, and still is, excellent ring material. 
talk about second ring designs. When I started, I shouldn't tell you this again, again a long time ago, but when I started, it was perfect circle only. That was before we bought the Muskegon Company. And all our second rings were a positive twist, taper-faced ring, just like the top ring, different material. You know, it didn't have a molly coating on it, but it was the same design, taper on the face of the ring, and I got pictures of these coming up, and a positive twist. And then we bought this company, any, I don't know if any of you worked here when we bought Muskegon. Remember when Dana bought the Muskegon Ring Company? They were just sold on a reverse twist second ring. Of course, seal power was too when we got in, in with seal power. And what happened in the next couple of years is the perfect circle guy said, oh, we see the light. Let's do a reverse twist second ring like the rest of the world and quit trying to sell everybody on our idea. So we went pretty, pretty quickly. Within a couple of years, we went to a reverse twist ring, just like seal power, just like Muskegon. Okay, that was the old days. Now it's what we call a THG or a Napier ring. And I know you make these here as well, but uh, those rings are, are sometimes called a scraper ring as well, but uh, they do a better job of controlling oil. And what's happened in the 35 or so years that I've been hanging around here, we've gotten smarter. And we realized again that that second ring, its job primarily is to control oil. We don't have to worry about compression because if it's getting by the top ring, guess what? We're already in trouble. So we're not worried too much about the second ring design in terms of, of compression, but we want a ring that's able to meter and control the oil. And by and large, Napier THG rings do a better job at controlling oil. Now a little side benefit is we gain tor torsional twist. When we cut that Napier, in that ring or that scraper groove, what it does, and I'll show you again about pictures coming up, it creates a torsional imbalance. One side of the ring is thicker and beefier than the other, and it causes the ring to do this. So we get torsional twist, even though we may not have intended it when we started, it's, it's just a kind of a fringe benefit of doing it, is we get that torsional twist. And the little napier, which faces down in the cylinder, that little cutout goes down, it provides a relief area for gas that may leak past the rings and need a place to go. It provides a nice spot for that gas to get to. And if we get rid of gas, that's good because we can load the ring, seal the cylinder the next time it fires. So we don't want gas trapped in between the rings in an engine. The top left, taper face. Notice how the face, which is the part of the ring sticking out of the piston, notice how it's tapered. Inside bevel, if you look at the back of the ring, back in the groove, what have we done to one corner? We beveled that ring, right? Okay. And we would call that a positive twist ring. And that is due to the fact that the bevel faces up and causes the ring to twist up rather than down. Great for compression rings, top rings. It still works good. Then the second ring, taper faced, inside bevel, but now which way is the bevel facing? The other direction. And it causes the ring to bend in the other direction. Now I might ask you, and I can't run up there and point to the pictures like I normally do, but why do we care if the ring twists a little? Pardon? Better contact where? No, that's good. You were really close. The contact that it improves is where the side of the ring touches the groove in the piston. Notice in the top one, at the top side, the ring is actually touching the piston. And at the bottom back, the lower side, it's touching the piston because it's tilted slightly into that groove. Well, think about this. We've got compression gas above it and it's coming down the cylinder, and it wants to get behind that ring. But if we keep that ring fairly tight in there by causing torsional twist, we don't get a lot of gas behind the ring. We have to have some because that's what forces the ring out against the cylinder wall. But we don't want a huge amount of gas migrating past the ring because if it gets to the back 
and gets by the ring, then it's down in, in between the rings. And then it causes issues. So torsional twist was a design years and years ago to prevent massive amounts of gas from sneaking past the ring, getting down in the crankcase. Now the bottom ring, we twist it the other way. Imagine now we got oil trying to work its way up. It gets to the bottom of the second ring and it's touching the piston right there. Can the oil sneak in behind that ring? Not very well. So again, it seals the oil off, keeps the oil from migrating its way up to the combustion chamber. So torsional twist rings have been around for years and that was the theory behind them. Why did we leave them? Well, what happened here in the last, oh gosh, decade or decade and a half is the rings kept getting skinnier and skinnier, thinner and thinner. If you've worked here very long, you've noticed that. Big old massive rings that we used to make, we don't make near as many of them anymore. We're down to one millimeter and 1.2 and 1.5 millimeter. Well, as those rings got thinner and thinner and thinner, it became difficult to put a bevel on the back without substantially reducing the amount of material that was there and weakening the ring. And you know, we got smarter as engineers and designers got smarter and we got better on oil control. And we've migrated to a point today where other than our scraper rings on the right, we really don't have any torsional twist rings in automotive stuff. Now we may still have in tractor and some other applications, but automotive, all our top rings today are a non-twisted ring. So this is our second rings today. What's on the left is pretty much history. And what's on the right is pretty much what we're doing today. A THG or hook groove or a scraper or if you will, a Napier style ring. Here is again showing the blow by. This would be the second ring in this case. So you see how the oil wants to get up there and it can't because that ring's actually touching the ring groove in the piston there at that lower corner. So it seals and prevents the oil from getting up there. And blow by of course will work its way past the top of the ring, get behind the ring and ultimately get down in the crankcase if we have enough of it. So. When we talk about directional rings, that's a ring that has to go in the engine in one direction only. It's designed to go in one position only. Our plant, that would be you folks, you like to keep changing around all these directional markings. Keep us guys in the aftermarket on our toes. Sometimes you do real good, you put top. But you put that C there, what, I don't know what the C means, but it confuses our customers. <laughs> so you put that there. Sometimes you put a really nice dot and occasionally, depending on how things are going here, you put a really faint pit mark in there that sometimes our customers have to look and look and look to see if it's there. But uh, it keeps us on our toes, gives our tech service guys something to do when they answer the phone calls. But uh, in all these cases, when a ring has some sort of marking on one side, it's directional. And in every case I've ever known, the mark faces towards the top of the piston. Never have I ever seen one where the mark was supposed to face the other direction. So anytime there's a top or a pit mark or whatever, it's going to the top of the piston. Now how about that Napier ring there, hook groove ring on the left, is it directional? Yep. Is it marked? Nope. You just did a new one for us. And man, it's got a little tiny, you can hardly even call it a Napier. But that would be a good one to mark because it would be easy for a, a installer to accidentally, you know, skip over that. Oil rings. For automotive, again, passenger cars and light trucks, three-piece oil rings are the norm. And primarily because they're cheap, and cost very much to make. And as you all know, with, with uh, automotive customers, the Fords and Chryslers and Nissans of the world, pennies, you know, drive this business. So a three-piece ring is cheap to make. 
it's, I call it easily modified, and by that we mean if we want to go from a nine pound tension to a seven pound, it isn't rocket science. We can shorten the expander up slightly, you know, and reduce the tension. So it's easily modified. And nowadays, they're light enough that they conform well to the cylinder. You know, if our cylinder is slightly out of round, and our ring is big and solid and rigid, is it going to follow that cylinder? No. And we're going to have gas leaking past the ring. So light, flimsy rings are more popular today than big, massive rings because they conform better to the cylinder, seal things better. And then the diesel engines, and again, we were just talking earlier, you do some of these here. Those are two-piece rings. They used to be cast iron with slots in them and a spring wire behind. And now I think most of them are steel today. And in the old days, the, the uh, rings were chrome plated. Probably they're gas nitride. I don't know what you do today. Gas nitride them? Still chrome plated them? OK. They're excellent. In fact, we have a couple race teams that we fooled around with providing them some samples because they're big and they're tough and they hold uh, their shape and they keep the tension well, but uh, they are expensive, you know, compared to that little three-piece ring. To give you an idea, we sell the three-piece ring that comes out of Atashiba to the race teams for $2.88. So, you know, it's, it's, and I bet we would be 10 or $12 if we were selling them the two-piece, you know, steel ring. So we have that to overcome whenever we talk about advancing technology as well, what's it going to cost? Okay. But they all last a million miles. And in a diesel truck, if you're supplying Cummins or Mack or one of the truck engine builders, they're looking at a million miles on an over-the-road truck. They don't want to service the engine until it sees a million miles. Well, a three-piece oil ring for $2.88 ain't going to make it a million miles. It just won't last. So these two-piece tougher rings, better rings, when you need a million miles out of service, that's what you use. So here's the three-piece design. It's called the CP20. And uh, CP stands for chem polished. They use that to polish the expander. The expander is the middle part. And then the top and bottom, there's two. I don't know. You probably don't see any of these because you don't make them here. The top and bottom are flat. They look like little compression rings. They're flat. And typically, the outer surface that contacts the cylinder is chrome plated. In fact, 98% of them are chrome plated. And then the expander, that waffled part in the middle, it gives those rails somewhere to rest. And basically, it keeps them where they need to be, top and bottom of the groove, when the whole thing is assembled. And when we talk about a 20 degree ear angle, which was a either a perfect circle or a molly advancement. I forget what year we did it. Down there at the bottom, see where there's a little tab on the, on the far right side of the expander? That little tab is what the rail rests on. And that little tab is actually bent at a 20 degree angle from, from right angle. It's bent over 20 degrees. So when the rail hits it, it slides down the tab until it contacts the cylinder, or contacts, excuse me, the piston. And when it does that, contacts the piston, keeps the oil from migrating behind that ring and getting up into the engine. So it was an ingenious idea. And it is the bulk of what we sell in the aftermarket for light duty automotive. Probably 99% of what we sell is this ring right here. Now, let's change stream a little bit. And let's talk about <coughs> materials. And this little bar chart uh, actually got one, two, three, four, five bars. On the far left, kind of hard to read, but that is cast iron material. I think you're still using some here, right, at the plant? Gray cast iron, sometimes we call it gray cast iron. It's cheap. It's easy to make doesn't cost a lot to make. It's soft. And if you've ever tried to bend it, it doesn't bend very well. 
Matter of fact, every once in a while, a customer will break one trying to install it in the engine and call us wanting an extra ring. So it's soft. It will seat in about anything. That's the plus side of cast iron. And years ago, it was your standard ring pack. Cast iron top ring, cast iron second ring. This is back, now we're talking 30, 30 years ago. Okay? But it, remember we talked about the ability to withstand heat? This is 2200 degrees. Remember we talked about chrome being 3200? And then the uh, molly at about 4200? So that's what drove cast iron out of the marketplace. As the engines got smaller and fuel economy got to be an issue and we ran them leaner and more heat was built up in the engine, we got to the point where cast iron ring, especially top ring, it just didn't make it. It just wasn't good enough to even survive you know, the life of the car engine. So we saw a rapid movement away from cast iron top rings. Then we have this stuff called PC-479. That's hardened ductile. PC-479 was a hardened ductile ring, and it was pretty common in race engines, and it was relatively common in diesel engines 15, 20, 30 years ago. And then what we've really staked our wagon on in the aftermarket is SAE 9254. That's the high alloy spring steel, if you will, the, the wire that you form for us here. It, it, it's, it's really our mainstay, <coughs> excuse me, in the aftermarket today. Just stock replacement sets uh, on second rings and of course performance sets on top rings. So it, it's really good and it's, it's been good for us. And we're the only ones that do much with it. You talk to uh, Hastings, they tell everybody how much steel capability they have, and then when you get down to it, they have very little. Uh, most of the specialty companies are forming stainless rather than the 9254. And I don't want to get too technical, but uh, for our business, 9254 is better than stainless. Number one, stainless always has to be treated or coated. You can't run just a plain, ordinary stainless ring in a, in a cast iron cylinder. So we, we couldn't use it for second rings because we run in a plain 9254 second. And then the other thing is the hot hardness of stainless is not as good as 9254. And again, what of engines, especially race engines, make a lot of heat. So the ability to have a better ring at hot hardness than stainless is a good selling point for us. So it's, it's a good ring for us. This is just ring nomenclature. It's common in the industry. I just put it up here because we do this basic presentation a lot for our customers. Matter of fact, next Tuesday, I'm going to be at JEGS. If you've ever heard of JEGS, <laughs> going down to JEGS and doing presentations for their salespeople. And so what we like about this is if everybody knows this and you are a customer and you call on the phone and you say, I got a problem with the end gap. We know immediately what you're talking about. Because everybody in our business calls that the gap or the end gap. Now, if you say, I got a problem with that space in my ring. Yeah, well, maybe that's the space above the ring. Maybe it's behind the <coughs> ring. You know, it helps in our business to have everybody on the same page. Radial wall is another one we use all the time. And as you can see there on that upper right, radial wall is from the face of the ring that touches the cylinder to the back side of the ring. And there's a dimension for that. And our customers need that dimension because they have to make a piston to fit the ring. So they'll call, you know, the savvy ones at least and say, hey, I need to know the face width and the radial wall on that ring. And so we give them the face width, which we call periphery there, but face width, radial wall. Sides, top and bottom. So if a customer says, I got a lot of pitting on the top side of the ring, I know right away we're talking about that flat surface on the top of the ring. So it just helps in our business if we can get everybody on the same page in terms of what we call the different features of a ring. Now change horses again a little bit, give you some more background and engine friction. Well, some 30 years ago, we got into uh, a drive to fuel economy in the US. 
fuel costs had just gone out of the, out of the site, and uh, engines were not very fuel economy uh, thrifty back then. And so the engineers at Ford and General Motors and Chrysler and the other car companies said, man, we gotta improve, we gotta improve our fuel economy. In fact, we have standards, you know, CAFE, CAFE standards, we gotta meet those standards. So one of the things they did was they said, how can you improve fuel economy in an engine? Well, one thing we could do is get rid of some of the friction, drag that occurs in an engine. Because anytime you got friction and you have to overcome the friction, it takes power, right? Does that power make the car go down the road? No, it's just making the parts go up and down in the engine. So they came real quickly to the thought that if we could reduce the friction, we can get an engine that's more fuel efficient because we don't have to waste that power just moving the parts. Well, it wasn't long until engineers said, look, 50% of the total friction in an engine is the rings sliding up and down on the cylinder wall. 50%. This is how it was back about 1985, 1990. We started down this road. That's a lot. <clears throat> So there's this little story, you've probably heard it before. You ever hear anyone talk about, let's get the low-hanging fruit? Well, here the engineers are saying, we need rapid change. Where are we going to look? Well, half the, ring, or half the engine friction is the ring pack. Let's go there, because, man, we can make major strides immediately. So they went to their ring pack, and they started reducing the tension on the rings. And the easiest way, <coughs> excuse me, to do that was to start making the rings smaller. And when we talked earlier about how the rings have gotten smaller, well, what was driving that is reducing the tension. Other than material change, which there wasn't many to choose from, the only way to reduce a ring's tension was to make it either narrower on the face width or reduce the radial wall. Okay, but we started, and of course oil rings, we started there too. So anyhow, this is the story. Some of you weren't even around in 1985, but for those of you that were, this was your typical four inch bore ring lineup in a 1985 350 Chevy. Top ring, it was 564 face width, and it made about 18 pounds of pressure on the cylinder wall when it was installed. Second ring was a 564 ring, and it made about 18 pounds of pressure. The oil ring was 3 16th, and it put about 24 pounds of pressure on the wall. Now 2015, I need to update this a little bit, but by 2015, we had got into a one millimeter top ring, substantially thinner than 564. How much pressure was it putting on the cylinder? Seven pounds. And a 1.2 millimeter second ring with eight pounds of pressure. And a 2.5 millimeter oil ring was seven pounds. So look like 18 down to seven, 18 down to eight, 24 down to seven. Do you suppose we reduce friction? Yeah, big time, big time. Now we didn't get there in just one year either. It was, a, as you know, working here, about every year or so, the uh, big three would change the ring lineup. You know, they get braver and braver. And as they get braver and braver, we finally edge down to one millimeter rings. That's a smaller and smaller and smaller rings, less and less friction, more power, better fuel economy, all driven by this. So it was amazing. I got to see it happen. So what it did do though for us and, and drove us crazy is in that time frame from about 1985 to about 1995 or so, they kept changing that ring lineup every year or so. So when a customer calls and needs a ring set for that engine, we have to be really cautious about what year is it? What was the VIN code on it? Because there could be just from one year to the next a change in the ring lineup. And the rings wouldn't fit otherwise. I just ran into this the other day. 1990 Chrysler pickup truck. And the guy didn't order the right rings the first time. So it, it was a, now we're, we're in pretty good shape, you know, because we've gotten about as far as we're going to get on the automotive side. 
But there were a period of a decade there where it kept us on our toes. This carbon steel, we've talked a lot about it, so I'll hit it again here. And this is the story we tell our customers. It's really great stuff. It's 35%, roughly 35% stronger than cast iron. So gram for gram, ounce for ounce, 35% stronger. The fatigue strength is better than anything we have today. We have less rings broken. Virtually never break a ring today. We can use it as, as we said before, a top and a second ring. And thanks to you all here at the plant, if you got wire, we can supply rings. In one millimeter, and 043, and 122, and 1.5, and a sixteenth, and 564. You know, it's just a matter of you having the wire, and we can supply rings. So it's, excuse me, a wonderful material. So as we said earlier, goodbye gray cast iron. It's pretty well sliding into the uh, history area. Okay. We talked a little bit about this, but we'll hit it one more. We're about done here. But again, ring material explanation. We used that gray cast iron for years because it was low cost. Matter of fact, when I started, uh, we had a foundry out here in Muskegon. And it was really cool. You could go in and see them actually cast the rings. It was amazing. I'll never forget my visit there and seeing them how they cast those rings. But we cast rings every day in the foundry there. We could run them uncoated in economy sets. We could use a uh, wire spray molly or later a plasma molly and coat the top ring. You know, it was pretty good stuff in its day. But remember, it was fragile. You couldn't bend it hardly at all, it would break. And it was soft, especially if we didn't coat it with something. So ductile cast iron, or nodular, if you will, has graphite inclusions, made it stronger. You can actually take a nodular cast iron ring, and you can bend it 180 degrees. It won't break. So it was substantially better. And it, for years, it was the ring of choice for race engines. And it was the ring of choice for tractors and trucks and stuff like that. Then we got to that hardened ductile, which I guess you say now is a 477, right, Bruce? That's the ductile that we yep. primarily make. Yep. Gotcha. GNS, we haven't talked about much today, but that's gas nitrided steel. And uh, you do that here, correct? Yes. Yep. So you can GNS rings here. Those oil rings we mentioned, quite a few of those, gas nitrided. How about compression rings? Yeah, we, uh, we can get things. OK, yep, OK. And then we've got, again, that SAE 9254. We talked a lot about it. We talked about stainless, OK? To get a ring that's stainless, technically, you got to have 13% of chromium in the material. That's what makes it a stainless, by definition. But remember, it's got to be coated if you're going to run it in a cylinder. So for us in the aftermarket, there's not a lot of desire for us to use stainless because it prohibits us from doing any second rings. So we'd much rather have 9254. And because the 9254 has a better hot hardness, stays hard at high temperatures, it's a better ring for our performance customers as well because they put so much heat in the engine. So we're not wild about stainless rings, although we have a few here and there in our line because that's what the OEs used. And then we've got this process at the bottom here called PVD. I'm pretty sure you put a system in here about two years ago to do that, right? As a matter of fact, you're doing all those top fuel nitro rings that are marked nitro. Those are all PVD rings that you're doing here. Any sputter here? Pardon? Yeah. Yep. The uh, Brazilians were big on sputter. Matter of fact, they made sputter bearings down there and actually sputtered the material onto the bearings. But a uh, lot of technology. And the cool thing, again, as I mentioned, somewhere in Mali, every bit of this is being done. So we, as an aftermarket supplier, we don't have to compromise based on what our capabilities are. Because we got the capability to do what needs to be done for an engine. So 
It's a good selling point again. This one, how many in here are involved in HV, high velocity, HVOF actually? I don't think it's 385 anymore, is it? 385 is just one of the color options. It's right. Okay. You know, and us, when we launch on like a trade name or a brand name, we keep it forever, <laughs> you know. So you might be four powders down the road and we're still calling it 385 in the aftermarket. But it's good material. Uh, we had good luck for about two years in the top fuel nitro engines. But what happens is when we started with that HV385, they were making you know, between eight and 9,000 horsepower. Well, now what did I say they're doing? Yeah, 11 to 12,000. So we give them better stuff and they just make more power and abuse what we give them. So it wasn't but about two years, they were knocking the molly out of that HV385. You know, so the PVD has been a good step, you know, a good advancement. But like I say, they're even able to pit that PVD face on some of their rings. So really tough environments. We love HVOF. It's been a good, again, another good selling tool for us. Nobody else in the aftermarket can supply an HVOF ring. So it's been good for us. This one, uh, real quickly, this is your face wear. And uh, this is ring wear on the dark cylinder bore wear on the right. And both are important. We can come up with the hardest stinking ring known to man. Matter of fact, our competitors have done this. They're making rings out of tool steel. Really hard. But guess what our customers are telling us? Their customers are telling us about the rings. Oh, man, where's the cylinder out? We got guys running offshore, these offshore powerboat engines, you know, these big ones. 80 hours, cylinders wore out. That isn't very good. But that tool steel ring, it, it looks like new. So, you know, we got to have, a, there's a trade-off there. We like a ring that's hard, but at the same time, if we're wearing the cylinders out in 80 hours, then what's, what's the advantage? So we look at it twofold. One is we'd like to reduce the face wear as much as possible, because that means the ring's going to last a long time. But we'd like to, as, as near as possible, we'd like to reduce the bore wear too, so that the cylinders aren't worn out after two or three races. So this is the chart from left to right. And you can see, by and large, as you go from left to right, it gets better. Scuff resistance, this is simple. When we say a ring scuffs, what we're actually saying is it welded itself to the cylinder. It got so hot, and there was so a little amount of oil there, lubrication, that it actually welded itself to the cylinder. And again, the Tall gray bar is scuff resistance. The taller that bar, the better. So you can see there, uh, those molly rings, they rank really high. Because remember, what is on the face of that molly? Lots of what? Lots of little pores. And the oil lays in those pores. And if the oil's there, there's very little chance for a ring to scuff. Flip that around. Those rings that are really slick and really hard on the face, where does the oil lay? Well, it doesn't. And so those rings, even though they're tough, they don't have a lot of resistance to scuffing because the face is so hard. So the gas nitrated ring you see there, it's pretty low. But that ring is really hard and the face is really smooth, so there's nowhere for the oil to cling to. So again, what we're looking for here is kind of a compromise, you know, acceptable toughness, but also a ring that doesn't seize up and weld itself to the cylinder. This one here, I'm going to skip over real quickly because we're out of time, and that is back clearance. That's the space between the back side of the ring and the piston. And what I mentioned this at all to our customers because when we went to a steel ring, and replace cast iron rings in our aftermarket sets, we had to make the radial wall smaller on the steel in order to keep the tension correct. Well, right away, customers start calling saying, oh man, I got all this clearance behind the ring. So we actually put a tech bulletin out. And with the help of our friends over in engineering in Muskegon, we figured out that it really means nothing. You know, there's so much gas to fill that void that it's really immaterial. 
But even today, after this is probably four or five years down the road, I still have to tell this to customers. And then the final one is this old myth that chrome plated rings require a longer break in and a rougher hone job because the chrome is so hard. Is that true? Well, the chrome is hard, that part's true. But what do you do with those rings out here? You lap them all. So they're broken in, pre broken in when our customers take them out of the package. But again, there's customers that, you know, they're in this time warp that they still believe this. So, and the final one, I run my end gap on the second ring smaller than the top because it expands less, doesn't get as hot. And that was true 30 years ago when we didn't know what we know today. Nowadays, we know that the second ring is an oil scraper. We also know that if we don't get the gas down past that second ring, it gets trapped between the two rings. The engine loses power. We can't load the top ring. It doesn't run very well. So actually today, we tell our customers, you'd like the second ring gap about 1.25 bigger than the top. Okay? Bigger. Not tighter, but bigger. So again, we're out there kind of myth busters sometimes in our business, dispelling ideas that people have carried for years. You've done a wonderful job here. We have a gal in uh, Mississippi named Julie Cox. And man, she is on it, on the inventory. And sometimes she probably puts pressure on you. But I've never been in that position where I had to go to a customer and say, well, we can't have a race next uh, month in Pomona because we're out of rings. You know, that's not what we want to do. And so it's the quality of stuff you do here and the help you give Julie and our ability to do that that lets us have 100% market share. It's a big deal for us, so thank you again. Any more questions? All right, thanks a lot. And thank you for selling us such a heck of a product. I mean, it's, it's really nice. You know, it's nice to go in there to Marta Coletta's with the best stuff in the world. Yeah, it really is.